This is my home at the southern tip of Africa. This place is special to me because it's the origin of our species, where we first lived in harmony with animals. My name is Anna. I've studied the ancient skills and I'm so passionate about awakening a sense of communicating with animals in us modern humans. I am dedicating my life to this because I believe that humanity is suffering from a great separation sickness, a real disconnect from nature. My sense is that by understanding animals more deeply, we can begin to heal ourselves. This is now my life. I talk with animals and they talk back to me. I first met Anna Breitenbach through a troop of wild baboons. My name is Swati. I'm a conservation journalist. I've often reported on this particular troop of baboons living on the fringes of Cape Town. They're constantly stealing food and breaking into cars. I've been jumped on by a big male who did not like me stopping him from getting into my car. Most people just don't know how to behave around wild animals and this leads to more conflict. Yet, on that first day I met Anna, she walked easily amongst them, although she had never been around this troop before. This particular group of baboons is quite aggressive because of all the human interference in their lives. When the alpha male returned after a while, I was lying down almost asleep. It was the alarm call of one of the females next to me that alerted me to his presence. When I saw the big male approach with all the babies around Anna, I was sure she was going to be attacked. I have seen this big male attack people he thinks are a threat to the young baboons. But that's not what happened. He stood cross-legged in front of me, looking down at me with a very inquiring look of evaluation. And I had the question fall into my mind as his question, which was, who are you? With a slight air of suspicion. I simply projected to him that I was there peacefully, just in a state of being, and right away he accepted me. And the alpha male kept on looking at me, and I got the distinct silent impression in my head from him, saying, seeing as you wanted to be with us, then do as we're doing and dig with me. And so I did. The way they were looking at me, particularly the alpha male, was with almost an appealing sense that, that I help humans understand who they really are. And there's a sense of confusion and sadness amongst them for the degree to which they're completely misunderstood. And the conflict with people is injuring and killing the baboons. This young male had his hand and his tail cut off in a trap when he was a baby. This female had her right hand cut off by a trap and she lost her second baby as a consequence. This female was shot on a ledge and she fell, losing her left hind leg. And this female had her right hand crushed by a gin trap.
and the big male who used to raid cars has since been shot for being considered too aggressive. And this is the pain of just one troop. Sometimes being a human bridge between non-human animals and my kind is, is difficult. I see both sides of that bridge. And the two pictures don't match up with each other. Many of the trapped and injured baboons are taken to this rehabilitation center where they get lifetime care and sometimes even regrouped into new family troops. Anna's work has been critical to this process of regrouping. When baboons are brought here, they are often housed in small groups at the main enclosures. Paul was one of these baboons. He'd been with two females for a few years. When I asked Paul if he would like to join a larger troop or stay in his current situation, he said he wanted to join a bigger group. I then communicated with the two possible troops he might be able to move into, one of which agreed to take him in. Adult male baboons never enter a new troop unless they're trying to challenge the existing alpha or steal the females. And so it was surprising to see how quickly Paul was welcomed instead of being attacked or killed. One of my favorite animals at the sanctuary is this wise old baboon who has lost much of his sight after having one eye knocked out by a brick thrown at him and damaging the other in a fight. He can never be set free. I always bring him some cuttlefish from the sea as he seems to savor the memories it brings him of his past life as a wild baboon on the coast. This gentle baboon has inspired me to help captive and wild baboon populations be better understood by humans. I wondered if there were any scientists studying the idea of animal communication. Matthew Zulstra is doing his PhD at the Stellenbosch University in the Western Cape. I wanted to see what a scientist would make of Anna's ability to communicate with such big, powerful animals like baboons. I took them to the mountains of Scarborough, outside Cape Town, where there is conflict between the wild baboon troop and people. This makes the baboons quite hard to approach. This area is also vast, making it difficult to locate the animals as they could be anywhere on the mountains. Anna was not familiar with this area and I knew it would be a challenge just for her to find them. I sent out a silent message in words in my mind without using my voice, addressing the baboon species and letting them know that I was coming. I didn't look around for any physical signs. After a few moments of that, I opened my eyes again and just allowed my body to move in the direction that I felt drawn to, almost like an internal sort of radar for baboon energy. And she found the truth. What happened next was really remarkable. She seemed to be communicating with the baboons as they walked right up to her, ignoring Matt and me.
always ask me, how does science explain this? I also think of the, um, of how it must have been for people back in the 17th and 18th century. And they used to see lightning. But if you ask them, um, uh, do you believe in electricity? Uh, they would have said, no, not at all. I mean, they would have laughed at you. And maybe what we're seeing now with Anna is, is being back in the 17th century and seeing lightning. What I know is that my belief systems and everyone's belief systems are formed over, um, over the course of their life. And these belief systems filter how we see reality. And we use these belief systems um, and our perceptions to edit out the stuff that we're not comfortable with. And I think that's what happens in situations like this. Um, we almost cannot help but letting our belief systems sort of edit out at the things which we don't feel comfortable with. But on a personal level, I feel profoundly touched and my scientific curiosity is awakened to really want to understand this phenomenon much better. Because I don't feel this is just about uh, communicating with animals, as amazing as that might be. But the essence here is about sustainability and about how we as humans can, can find a way to meaningfully reconnect ourselves with, with the rest of the living planet. The extreme disconnection of humans is something that we see in the destruction of nature at the hands of mankind. We see devastating fires. We see urban areas encroaching into wild lands. We see our oceans being poisoned by toxic chemicals and the results of that and we only seem to care about it when it affects us really, really badly. Perhaps that is too late. Most of us have had a relationship with a domestic pet at some point in our lives, but whether it's a domesticated or wild animal's eyes that we are looking into, how can we not see an intelligence and a being in there? How can we not know that they have thoughts and feelings? Anna started out as a systems analyst in the corporate world before she quit to become a full-time animal communicator. She is now regularly invited to help zoos, vets and sanctuaries to solve problems by communicating with the animals they have difficulty with. Anna's work intrigued me, so I joined her on a consultation. Anna was invited by Monkey Land, a free-roaming sanctuary for rescued monkeys and lemurs. She was here to communicate with a capuchin monkey called Artifa, who was not fitting into the social hierarchy. Artifa was also always having her babies in the winter months instead of the summer, thereby endangering their survival. I spoke beforehand to the curator Christian and asked him to tell me something about Artifa that only I would know and not Anna. Christian told me that Artifa had been rescued from a lab where she'd been experimented on. We, we've always been under the opinion that she is from vivisection. That was told to us by Stuchten Ark. Exactly what was done to her, we're not sure about. Um, her, her social structure in the group, she's never really become one of the big females as, as other individuals that came with the same batch. And um, we have had her at the vet once before as well. And uh, the vet commented that there, there's a lot of incision, a lot of scar tissue on her, on her stomach. This, this constant rearing of babies in the winter months is, is a bit, uh, strikes us a bit weird. When I am communicating something to an animal, I am silently forming a sentence in my head or a mental image and simply projecting that 
and I imagine it landing in their space without using my vocal cords, without physically talking. When I get a response from an animal, it is in that universal language, something that my brain can then translate into images, emotions, thoughts, feelings or words as a way for me to understand what just happened. When I got mm. that she's, um, she notices she's here amongst her kind, but um, she doesn't really know her, how to successfully be a capuchin, and mm. so she doesn't, she doesn't catalyze social interactions or try to form relationships. Well, there were, were repeated sort of physical interventions, mm. and I mm. kept on getting the image of her being on her back with all four limbs uh, restrained, literally tied mm. down, and, um, and her being repeatedly set sedated as well. Uh, I just picked up again a slight, a slight tummy ache okay. getting the solar plexus pain, but it felt, it felt <coughs> old to me, like scar tissue related, mm. not, uh, you know, I got that she's really quite healthy now. The scars that Anna mentions on the capuchin, these aren't scars that you can see on the monkey. I mean, these are scars that are buried beneath her fur. You would need a scan to be able to tell she even has them. And I know that Anna knew nothing about this capuchin. Only I had information on her because Christian told me. And often our awareness goes straight to the area of the body where they are having a problem. They show us that right away. But they again show us from their perspective how they are experiencing that physical sensation. So one can tell the difference in the quality of a physical sensation or a pain. Is it a dull throbbing pain or a sharp stabbing pain? Is it there constantly or only occasionally? Is it quite surface level or you know more deep? Yeah. And it was actually quite quite scary, to say the least. Um, I was hesitant initially, of course. Uh, I think as most people may be in the beginning. But um, there was something that that I just can't explain. That that I actually couldn't have said. Okay, well I've heard this from somewhere else. Or that there's trickery involved. When I asked her about the, her pregnancy situation and the fact that she only comes into estrus at the coldest times of year, um, she again was just sort of saying, well, that's just how I am. Um, there wasn't a sense of, of being planned or even really an awareness of it being seasonal. Then, you know, encouraging her to try to come into estrus in the warmer climate as well, she, she conveyed to me that she doesn't really have a sense of having control over her own body. And Christian seems satisfied with Anna's communication. I definitely accept it, um, and, and I think the most the most important thing that I that I heard out is that it's actually her choice. So you know, if, if we don't have to really worry about it too much, and if she chooses to be like that, then uh, then it's all right. You know, as long as it's her choice and she's all right with that, then then, then that's fine. I then went with Anna to Birds of Eden, the largest free-flying avian facility in the world for rescued birds. Anna had been asked to try and help with a cockatoo called Coco. Coco would often bite visitors and so had to be moved from the free-flying area to one that was confined. His caregivers could not understand why Coco was not happy to fly freely like the other birds. I'm suddenly awash with this incredibly intense emotion. This absolute sadness that is coming from Coco and it's flowing over me entirely. It's not from me and it's really creating such anxiety and my tears from my body are overflowing with that emotion that I'm experiencing on his behalf. He seems to have had a very close bond with his mm. person before the person who had him. Mm. And he's so upset to be separate, separated from that person. And he's, uh, he's in a lot of emotional pain still. Mm. He doesn't really understand why he's here at all, not in this cage, but at Birds of Eden. It feels like it was a very sudden separation. Perhaps something even happened to his, his person. It was a very sudden separation after quite a long relationship, and he never saw his person again, and not even for a visit. I then checked with Lara, the co-founder of Birds of Eden, to check if anything that Anna had said made sense. Coco's owner had to immigrate, leave the country, 
And it was a very sudden thing. He raised him from baby, baby age, spoon fed him, and um, they definitely had a great bond. I mean, this is the story. We, he, she sent a little letter mm. saying that we must please care for him and she loves him so much and so forth. Never seen his owner since? No, never seen the owner. Um, I don't actually even know her name. In Coco's particular case, his relationship with his human is far more important than being able to fly free. And just a few weeks after our visit, Coco died. With both the animals, I mean with the capuchin and the cockatoo, Anna got information that was accurate. I could verify it with the caregivers of both these animals and I know that she didn't know anything about these animals before we got here and so the simplest explanation seems to be she's getting her information from the animals. But then all these questions then come up, like, how is she doing that? What is she doing? And can you, I mean, can I, can we all do this? For any of us to connect with the fabric of life, it's important to find some quiet time in natural surroundings. To restore my balance and renew my sense of inner peace, I spend quite a lot of time in nature just simply being quiet and absorbing a harmonious state of being with the aspects of nature around me. And it's when I'm in this state that animals will often spontaneously approach me. And I'm always very humbled by that. It's always great to have an animal in its natural environment allow me close as if I'm no threat or disturbance on the landscape then I know that my inner state is matching that animal state of presence and well-being. From a quantum point of view, which is the more uh, sort of recent side of, of physics perhaps, we are all as beings walking, talking collections of uh, molecules that are made up of atoms, that are made up of quanta. And as unique bundles of quanta, we vibrate with a very unique energetic uh, frequency. So this is how different individuals show up in the universe as having a unique energetic fingerprint or footprint, if you like. So an analogy would be to talk about, uh, imagine that we are tuning in like a radio frequency to the particular radio station that is that unique frequency of that animal that we are connecting with. And once we have sort of dialed them up in the universe of all possible beings, we then have an open and clear communication channel between us and that animal and it's across that channel that information passes freely in both directions. The essence of what Anna is claiming to do is not new. Most indigenous communities around the world also speak of being able to communicate with animals. The survival of these communities depended on the hunt. And so it seems that tracking is the origin of this ability to be able to communicate with the natural world. I think, I believe people had that all the time. It's a, a natural gift. You know, it comes with being born in nature. You know, we're all part of nature, just that we become educated and thought we could be, do better without it. So I, it's a natural gift that we have as human beings, and it's just reclaiming it. The birds, plants, night sky, yeah, the river, everything, yeah, they become your family. Walaja. Yeah, everything is part of you. They're connected to you. You're in relation with the land. Yeah. Ah, da, chachi amate no. Chakama Angu Koho Mashi, Chachama Tinusha Koho Emanjakumata, 
Animal tracking is the oldest form of interspecies communication. Connecting with an animal's footprint automatically puts us in touch with that animal's body and mind. My ability to communicate triggered when I was on a tracking course in the United States. Here I met John Young, a master tracker. He encouraged me to explore my abilities further. Expanding my nature awareness and tracking with John completely changed my life. John is a founder leader of a worldwide movement to help connect people with their natural heritage. Since childhood, John was mentored in traditional native tracking skills and deep nature connection. You just stare into the footprint in, in a diffused, kind of relaxed way and just, in a certain sense, begin talking. Um, the way you need words, it's just sort of something starts to come. And then all of a sudden, out of the track comes a picture, and your mind is filled with an image. And it's a very clear image, and you couldn't have generated it yourself. Um, there's so much information in that one billionth of a second, even in the look on the face of the animal looking back at you. Now the University of Vermont in the United States has recently asked John to create a course in nature connectedness and awareness. It will be a whole new field of study. I also work with John around the world to reconnect people with nature and themselves. For a long time, John was the only person I could speak with about my ability to communicate with animals. Okay, when did you first notice these skills coming on? It was during our wolf tracking expedition 10 years ago. We were all woken at around 2 or 3 a.m. by the distant sound of wolves howling. I remember the next morning um, telling you about what happened to me in the night. When the wolves were howling, I had this spontaneous mini movie play in front of my eyes, which was the image of an elk kill, partially submerged in very shallow, muddy water and the particular configuration of wolves and how three of them had walked slightly offset from each other, side by side, out of the water in a certain sort of sequence and which direction they had done that. And I remember telling you about that the next morning and a few hours later one of the tracking teams that were out following tracks and sign found exactly that scene. Yeah. I remember that morning we were able to verify that whole thing. We sat under those pines on that hill and looked out over that place. Remember we had to take our time going in because the wolves were still there and we had to wait for them to leave. And I'd just been heard howling. Uh, yeah, I remember that like, like it was yesterday. And that's where I really did a lot of research and discovered this whole field called interspecies communication. Hmm. Meantime, continuing doing tracking and being out on trails and so on, by just opening my awareness and really softening my body and my mind, I would start to have more intuitive experiences. When it switched on strong when I was 19, there was no going back. Yes. You know, and that was that ex experience that got me in so much trouble talking about publicly, you know, when I saw the silver lines for the first time and followed them right to the deer. Sometimes it's just suddenly like this line of light appears on the landscape and I just start following it. Um, and then it disappears. You know, it shows up long enough for me to know it's time to move. Um, and then I start moving. And at that point, the rest takes care of itself. My body wants to go that way. It wouldn't go any other way. And then I discover, oh, there's that nice fresh track again. I look at it and I recognize that individual track again. It's the same individual and I always have to laugh at myself. When you have that moment of reconnecting with the animal physically at the end of that trail, there's a moment of grace. I have to say, I get a little choked up each time, um, as I am right now. 
where I feel like, whoa, what a miracle uh, that we live in a world like this. You know, that, that this could be possible. And I always give thanks in those moments to my ancestors, to the Creator, uh, because that's what my elders told me. That's where it's coming from. And whether I understand that or not, it's, it's irrelevant. I just feel incredibly blessed in those moments. And I, I wish life could go on forever. Ah, I think I'm going to go to the house. 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 I'm going to go I wanted to experience in the field how tracking became the origin for this ability to communicate with animals. John calls it intuitive tracking, Anna calls it animal communication. So I joined John and Anna as they attempted to track an eland in a vast wilderness area of the Cape Peninsula. So when I look at this track now, I, I see the face of this animal looking back. I can see its glistening eye, and I see a tear duct, and so I see the face. And there's so many signals in my body that I have to listen to, you know? Some of them are playing tricks on me, and the other one is, is dependable, you know? And what I've noticed is that once I lock on, I can even try not following it, and I'll still be following it. So that's how unconscious it is when I'm following an animal. John, that's exactly animal communication right there. When I'm with tracks or communicating with an animal remotely, there's this internal voice of the mind that runs various options by me. Looking at the airland track connects me directly into the signature frequency of the animal. Even if this animal were amongst a herd of others, I would still be able to find this particular individual because it is her tracks that I'm connecting with. Then they just walked, hardly looking at the ground for tracks and sign, except very occasionally. What gets me on the right track is, is not um, anything but my body having a desire to go somewhere. So I just feel this need to go somewhere. And it just pulls me, basically. John, you speak of being pulled in that direction. And for the last several minutes, I've been feeling that that's exactly where she is right now. And she's very aware of us connecting with her as well. Mm. There's this aliveness in the connection itself. I don't know if I'm really trying to understand an animal, I just need to do everything it does if I can. You know, get in its space, see what it eats, walk on its runs, lay in its beds. Just really try as much as I can to get as much about this animal as I can from the landscape. When I step onto a fresh trail, my legs will get hot right to the knees, and I'll feel like uh, almost like static electricity going up mm. and down my body, like uh, I've rubbed my feet on the, on the rug or something in a dry place. It's a connection with the life that has passed through here. Yeah, yeah. In some ways, looking for tracks is distracting. If I look for the footprints, I might get caught in a different animal, or, you know, it's almost like there's too much information on the ground. So, uh, for this reason, I let my body do the tracking, and I occasionally check in with my eyes. And then they told me that they could feel that it would only be a few minutes before we saw the eland. But following with the camera, I started having my doubts. There was not a single animal in sight, and it was getting dark. It's as if I can see through this Irland's eyes, and I feel like she's looking to the west towards the sunset. And I can feel the sensation of a low bush at her back as she enjoys the last rays of sunlight. That's the one. such gratitude when things like this happen and uh, I, I'm surprised every time it's as if it's the first time and I feel such a uh, like a hint of grace like the universe is 
such a gift. I mean, to be alive is such a gift. To share this world with these beautiful beings is such a gift. And it never ceases to amaze me every time this happens. <laughs> And having studied animals since I was a very little kid, um, I see that the animals have these skills, and it's obvious that they do, and a lot of researchers will tell you that they do. You know, the phenomenon of directional bonding, homing pigeons, for instance, you know, how strange is it that a bird can fly directly to a point on a landscape having never been there, you know, being put in a basket and taken on a crazy route to get there, and they fly exactly back to where they came from, or when I've been, been involved with radio telemetry studies and the mountain lion that's got the collar on it's flown the hundred miles directly to the east into the mountains, again into a place it's never been, uh, the cat beelines straight back to the suburban neighborhood where it's been caught. Um, when I see that kind of thing, you know, I know that there's something else happening, and I feel like that directional bonding is exactly what I'm experiencing when I'm tracking. What we're doing when we talk about intuitive tracking and connecting people in this manner may be the most important thing there is right now, because it gets right to the heart of connection. Uh, when people have connection, they feel compassion, they see the earth, they feel the earth, they feel the other life forms, including the human beings, um, and they become part of a fabric of we instead of I. Even after everything that I've experienced with um, Anna and, and spending all that time with her, there's a that scientific control, you know, sort of rational part of my brain still has doubts. So I wonder what it will take to totally convince me. And then a unique opportunity presented itself. In the course of my work, I had come across the story of Jörg Olsen, an ex-policeman turned conservationist. Jörg and his wife Karen set up the Jukani Predator Park. Here, many big cats rescued from bad zoos and canned hunting farms are offered a home and get lifetime care. Jörg has a remarkable relationship with his cats and he handles them in a way I have seldom seen before. There was one big cat here that he did not know what to do with. This black leopard, called Diablo, had been rescued from a European zoo where he'd been abused. That experience had made him suspicious and vicious. All he did was sit in his night shelter and snarl at anyone who came close to him. Six months in, and Jörg was at a loss as to how to deal with this cat. That whole atmosphere there, there was a vibe of aggression and of, um, I hate you and I will kill you. And, you know, the one encounter I had with him, um, he sent me to hospital one bite, one week. Here, I thought, was the perfect case. If Anna could get this animal to change his behavior and become well-adjusted, then I would have no choice but to acknowledge that she was in dialogue with animals. It took me some time, however, to convince Jörg to bring in Anna. He's a dangerous cat. He's very, very dangerous. Um, he's towards me and towards everybody else. In my opinion, the chances of an animal communicator changing that, um, it'll take a lot to convince me. Um, I honestly do not believe that an animal can talk to a human or communicate with a human. Um, I've had animals my whole life. Um, we give them commands, we give them instructions, and they do it as we habituate them, basically. Um, but I, I'm very skeptical to think that an animal like Diablo will communicate or can communicate with humans. Um, 
I am desperate, however. I do not want to lose him. I made sure that Anna had no information on Diablo or his history before she came to speak to the Black Leopard. I was nervous to see what would happen as this animal never let anyone near his night shelter without a lot of snarling and growling. But the minute he saw Anna, he calmed down and let her kneel right outside and look at him. This beautiful black leopard that you've asked us to communicate with is very overawed by his new surroundings, having come from a very uh, cramped and stressful place for him. But this place has been provided for him, but he's been quite conditioned by a very unfortunate past. Um, he doesn't want much to do with humans as a result. He's immensely powerful, and I mean not just physically, which you well know and respect, but he's immensely powerful with uh, a wisdom and an energetic presence and personality that is far bigger than anyone has ever appreciated about him before. And he commands a certain amount of respect for that. Again, not in a needy way, but really just out of, um, by virtue of who he is as a being. There's a very particular thing about his name, uh, Diablo. He wants that name changed because he doesn't like the associations with it, the blackness, the darkness, the diabolical. And when asking him about his past before coming here, he shows concern for two young cubs that were next to him. He's asking what happened to them with a great sense of, of care and concern. We actually forgot about that. When we went to fetch him, there was so much excitement about bringing him back here. Um, it actually slipped my mind until she said, um, he asked about the two cubs. And then we have remembered there were two little young leopard cubs next door to him that came from Rustenburg. And they were sort of semi-wild. They weren't hand yet. And it just slipped my mind. And when they talked about it, I couldn't believe, I, I actually did believe it. I mean, then I really believed that they were communicating. And when she communicated with him, and when we spoke to her, and she relayed all the information back to us, firstly, I didn't believe her. You know, what, uh, you know, it's things that anybody can think out, and you can think, you know. And then she said something about the cubs that was with him, that were with him. Um, and that changed this whole thing because now all of a sudden, you know, that's something that she didn't know about. And I've also reassured him that you have no demands of him here, that you're quite happy to um, not make any physical demands of him or any expectations for display or interaction, that you're really willing to let him be how he wants to be. And that's given him an enormous sense of relief. Yeah. And having told him that has for the first time made him actually, uh, actually genuinely interested in now exploring a bit further. Now that he feels that he's not being asked to come out more, he's genuinely interested in being relaxed enough to have a natural curiosity come out and to actually expand his horizons a bit. And Yeh was just stunned when the black leopard walked out of his night shelter into the larger enclosure later in the afternoon. In the six months that the cat had been here, Yer had never seen him out of the night shelter. He then decided to rename the leopard Spirit. We told him that same afternoon that we're not going to call him Diablo anymore. Um, and we understand and we agree with that the diabolical side of it that's not what he is to us um, and we'd like to change his name to Spirit as I walked to him I thought listen he asked about the two young leopards and I thought well I'm here now there's nobody else here I'm not going to look like a fool if something if I if he ignores me um, I'll tell him what what happened to those leopards 
And I told, and as I called him and I said, Spirit, and he was looking at me, he was lying like that. I said, with regards to the two little leopards, I just want to assure you and I want to tell you that they're safe. And I couldn't help it. I just said to him, wow, you're beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, that's moy. That's moy. And he gave me that, oh. And I thought, what's happening here? And I said to him, you understand what I'm telling you if I say to you that you're the most stunning cat? Oh. And I spoke to him and he answered me about 19 times. And he just sat there and he was totally relaxed. Um, it's the first time, it's the first time since we had him that I felt at ease with him. I felt that he was relaxed and he understood me. It was, to say that I don't know what it feels like for him. For me, it was the most amazing moment. Later that afternoon, Anna came back to check up on Spirit and to see how he was doing. I'm asking him now about how he experienced the communication from Jochen through the fence. And he said it's the first time that someone has directly expressed to him verbally um, appreciation for who he really is, not how they see him to be. And that really surprised him. <laughs> <laughs> he shows me an image of literally stopping in his tracks by surprise at that sense of just this wall of appreciation coming towards him. He is so relieved that nothing's being demanded of him here. He's just so relieved. It's like this weight is lifted from his shoulders. <laughs> and when he was grunting back, he said he was saying thank you for the thank yous. So of each thank you he was getting, he was saying thank you back. <laughs> Is there anything you'd like to say about that feedback? I think we'll talk about this a bit later. I can't listen. two different animals. It's two totally, totally different personalities. We had a snarling cat, angry at everything, um, upset about being here, uh, hating humans, hating us for having him here, um, you know, ready to kill in an instant. To this relaxed, black leopard that's lying on top of his log in his shelter is this attitude of you, you recognize me for who I am now and it's amazing to to talk to him and get the talking and get him to talk back to us. Jach and Karen attended Anna's workshop on animal communication and now use it regularly with all their animals. He, uh, <laughs> he changed my whole life um, and spirit and animal communication has taught me you know, when I work with, with my other lions, um, the reactions you get, the, the communication you get back, the feelings you get. Um, you know, you get, sometimes you get lions or Queenie, for instance, that's unhappy with something that happened. And I'm not sitting out there wondering what's wrong with her. She tells me, and I can correct it, and I can make her happy, because she is in my, I have to look after her, I've got to make her happy. Um, it changed the whole family. The opportunity for every individual on the planet to connect again with nature is right there on our doorstep. It's a matter of simply looking up into the sky to notice the clouds and wind direction, to pay attention to the sounds of the birds around, to feel what it's like to have bare feet on the earth and to notice with our own bodies and our five senses what's going on around us. And that will result in us developing a more intuitive and natural way of knowing how to treat our environment. It's not supernatural. It is supernatural, as in very natural. It's the blueprint of our brains. These ways of knowing and communicating were the way of all our human ancestors. 
We see how our children come alive when they are out in nature. And as adults, we must remember that we are living in a world borrowed from our children's future. This is a most delicate time in human history on the planet. And for sure, the future of the planet and all her inhabitants rely on what we do now and what choices we make. Those choices can be informed by what the animals are telling us if we are just willing to listen and to hear. Perhaps the only real question for us humans is how are we going to respond?